Mr. Hurt, or John, may I call you John? I'm Pete. Uh, I, as I told you in my letter, I wanted uh, the readers of this magazine to, to get to know you. And too often, I think, uh, we have people writing about musicians, and, and I, I know that musicians can often speak for themselves better than anybody else can speak for them. For example, this uh, man, Doc Boggs, wrote the story of his life, and, it, and everybody said it was one of the best things that Sing Out ever printed. Just telling how, when he was a young man, he was working in the mines, and he also liked to make music, and how he made his first record, and then he decided to give it up, and he told in his own words the story of his life. And I know that uh, within the last year that there's just uh, thousands of people that have heard your music. If you could simply tell them your own story. They, when the article is printed, it would be your story. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be somebody else uh, trying to tell it. I think maybe just I might start off with just getting, uh, as they say, the vital statistics. That is, you were born how long ago? 1892. This was in Avalon, were you born? Five miles from Avalon, a little place to call Teoc, Mississippi. And I, they brought me up to Avalon when I was just a baby. Was your and I grew up in Avalon. Did your uh, father and mother live in Avalon? Oh, they, did. Um, they did. My father... He homesteaded some land, and they had a little place there in the for the land. What do you mean, homesteaded land? I don't guess up north, I don't know that. Some way he, you know, bought this land from the government. Uh, well, really, it means what I understand. You just go and uh, clean up some land that belonged to the government. Yes. You know, make a... Grow cotton or something? Grow cotton, corn, peas, potatoes. And uh, so they'll just give you that land. You, you know, get the timber off of it. You know, and in other words, make farmland out of it, see. Clean it all. When did you first make music? What you might call kind of stole my way of making music in a way. There was a gentleman that uh, would come to see a school teacher, the school that I went to, I was eight years old. And he would come up every weekend to see this teacher. He could play guitar. I don't know how many numbers he could play, but I never heard him play but one. And he'd bring his guitar along and make a little music for this teacher. And I was a very small boy, eight years old. And he, he lived a good piece from the school. And he knew my mother well. I said, like Friday evening, he would spend the night, you know, at my mother's house and play that number for her. When he play that number, I want to learn it all for band. I want to learn to play guitar anyway. I always liked music. And he would sit his guitar down, you know, like this. And I, he'd be ancient around. He'd, you know, I'd get up there and pick it up. And he said, uh uh, son, put that down. And my mother would speak up and say, yeah, put that man's guitar down. I'd say, yes, mother, I put it down. And I studied me a sharp plan to, you know, that guitar and try to learn. And my mother said, Oh, it's about time you go in the room and go to bed anyway. Yes, mother, I'd get up and I'd go in the room and go to bed, but I wouldn't go to sleep. And when they quit talking and go in their rooms, different rooms, you know, and go to bed, well, I'd lie there, you know, listen, listen. Away in the night, and I figured they'd sleep, you know. I'd get up, I'd tip to my mother's room door, and I'd listen. I could kind of hear her say, say, Yeah, she's asleep. I'd go to this gentleman's room door, I could hear him good saying, <laughs> I said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I would tip around, you know, and get his guitar. And I just, about like that, you know. And I kept doing that until I liked that number. And when I learned to play that number, good. Why? I didn't care if it did. <laughs> yeah, me then. I wake my mother one night about one o'clock, playing that number. <laughs> and she opened the room door and peeped in there. She says, huh? This is my Lord. I thought that was William Henry. That is a gentleman's <laughs> name. I said, no, mother, this means. 
She stood there for a good little bit. She looked, I looked around, she just standing there. I said, and mother, I want you to buy me a guitar. She said, I hadn't got a thing to buy you no guitar. <laughs> and uh, so the white woman that she watched for, why he would, she was telling him about it. <laughs> the next day was watch day, you know, after. And she was telling him about it. He says, well, Mary Jane, that's my mother's name, says, why don't you get him a guitar? She said, uh, Mr. Kent, I'm not uh, able to buy him a guitar. He said, how do you know? She said, well, I know I haven't, I haven't got nothing to buy him a guitar. I haven't got anything. You could get a good guitar then for $10. That's right. And he said, Mary Jane says, our guitar is practically new that my boy married all left at home and he told me that I could have it. Said he didn't want it, sell it or anything. Said, I'll let you have that guitar for him for one dollar and a half. And she bought it. <laughs> so I just kept going then. <laughs> well, did you ever play play for money for for people or uh, before they recorded you? This is way well, back when he's talking about. Yeah, when when you were, how how is it that you come to make that you came to make those records in 1926, Was it when 28, 20, 29. 28 and 29. That's right. Well, it was a white gentleman that lived near me, and he was a fiddler. He was a fiddler. Fiddler. Hmm. Uh, that was uh, Mr. Willie Normal. That was his name. And he went to a fiddling contest at Winona, Mississippi. A town named Winona, Mississippi. Okay. That was about 90 or 95 miles from where me and him lived. And Mr. T.J. Rockwell and Mr. Stevenson were there at this fiddling contest going through, you know, such music. And uh, so after he won the contest why they gets after him to come to New York and make some records for him. And he agreed that he would. And then they asked him, says, uh, well, is uh, anyone else in your area that uh, played fiddle? I told him, said, no, not that I know of. He says, well, music of any kind. He said, well, there's a color fellow in my area. So I think he plays music, plays the guitar mighty well. He said, switch away, are y'all going back to New York? He said, oh, I guess uh, back 51, the way we came down here. And he said, well, he says, why don't you come go back to Greenwood, Mississippi yeah, says. Mississippi 51. <laughs> <laughs> says, just as near. And just about it straight away and said, I'll take you by this fellow's house. And they agreed, said, well, all right. So they awake me one night about one o'clock. Hmm. And I thought, I know when uh, Mr. Norman was so well, and he knew me so well. Sometime, you know, he would uh, come around and bring his friends, you know, and uh, we'd kind of have a little party, like just a little home party. And he... Called me that night about one o'clock and knocked on the door. I said, Who is it? And he says, uh, It's me, John Willie. Says, uh, Get up, says, Here's some fellas from New York. Want to hear you play, son? I said, Yeah, 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 I know, I know. I thought Mr. Indian you knew it. He put me on, you know. I said, Yes, it's all right, Mr. Willie, all right. Got up and opened the door and they walked in and spoke. And as soon as they walked in, I looked at them, I knew it. They didn't live around there because I knew everybody in a hundred miles of mother that lived around there, both white and black. So they told me to get my guitar, play them a number. And I did. And I started on another number, and he stopped and says, uh, what about uh, getting you to come to Memphis? 
and uh, make it right. I said, I had never did anything like that. He says, that's not the question. I know, no, <laughs> says, but I said, uh, what about getting you to do that? Uh, I said, well, I guess I will. He said, have you ever been to Memphis? Said, Once or twice? Yeah, he says, uh, well, yeah, he says, I'll give you one of my cards to the OK building. And so he did. He says, now, I'm going to leave your train fat with Normo. At that time, Normo was driving school bus. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, Willie, will you promise me that you get into the trains and I want you there the 18th of February? He says, I will. I'll get into the train. And so he did. Now he goes to Memphis and uh, made uh, two records for him. Got back home. Was at home one week. And he sent me a letter and my train fare in there to come to New York for further recording. So I went there and I was there. Took a train up to New York. Said he did. And so I recorded from New York. And I got back home. Going back home, you know, I went to working on the farm, railroad, and the river. All right, so in a short period of time, I don't know, they sold out without a business, uh, some kind of way, I don't know, but uh, never did hear any more from them. I, I know pretty good why when I did hear why. They don't have business. So there I wait for 35 years, and these people <laughs> came along. <laughs> you mean absolutely, you know, nothing, I mean, playing, of course, but no records, no recording? That's right. Between it all. No recording between anyway. I, I heard a couple of your records in Chicago in 1940, 42, something like that, 45. And uh, I remember asking there, I said, where is Mississippi John Hurt? No, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. They said, but uh, they treasured those records just like they were gold. <laughs> they, they really did. When you say you worked on the railroad, what kind of work? Was it uh, straightening tracks or something? That's right, what they call line track. And, uh, it takes about ten people at once, doesn't it? Something like that. How many? How many all work together to to straighten the line and track? Oh, about uh, ten, fifteen, from that to twenty. Yeah, and you know. Uh, they all get the bars underneath, and they kind of right, push in uh, time. That's right. Long bars, you know, not that long, I'd say. Well, and they won in the crowd around the railroad jack. I guess you've seen the railroad jack. And Actually, no, I've never seen it. You haven't? Well, in a way, why, it's got a, what I call a foot on it, you know, put it on the rail. Like, yes, cross ties, you put this foot right between those two cross mm -hmm. ties, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to jack up the track. So we can move it, see it, fix up ties and all. The section form. He's down on his knees, keeping down the track, you know, down the rail like that. And you're running this jack <laughs> sometime, uh, and you run it so fast, <laughs> why, you're liable to go over before he can hog. And uh, you be rip, 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 and if you go, you oh! Cut down one. That's one knot, you know. Let it back down. Right there, he said. All right. Then we all line up, get our lining bars, get on the rail. Here's a curve in there, you know, track crooked like that. Well, straighten it out. I said, it's straight here. Yeah. Turn the curve in that way when we push it all straight in line, you know, that. And when we go to, it's one in there. A thing, see, that's so we can keep the time and oh. put, share this track over. We were getting our balls and they says, all right, boys, all right, boys, all right, boys, getting our balls and they, Then we get our ball and turn our backs to the rail like this and stand straddle your bar. 
He said, all right, boy, let's go. Ada, when you marry, won't you marry me? Bottom of your flower bell, girl, you never see. That track is moving. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you remember any more of those verses? I, I I heard one. I I never saw it done, but I the reason I even knew the word lining track was that uh, this lead belly you heard some people tell about. He he used to sing a song. Oh boys, is you right? Done God right. All I hate about lining track. These old bars are gonna break my back. Yeah. Well, oh boy, can't you line up? Oh boy, can't you line up? Oh boy, can't you line up? See, Eloise go line and drag. I think that's. I think because you've done so much outdoor work in your life, that's why you lived such a ripe old age. <laughs> and you get some person been sitting at a desk all his life, they get all hunched over and they don't have enough energy. But <laughs> doing lots of outdoor work, why? Well, I did lots of it. You know, I don't wait. What do the people in Avalon think about you coming up north and, and singing around? <laughs> well, they... They're proud of it. <laughs> did, they, did the local newspaper write it up at all? Uh, in Avalon? Yeah. Is there a newspaper in Avalon? Sure, they... I don't know, there was one paper. Man, uh, he wanted to, the first time I came up here and went back home, he wanted to put a, a in the paper about me. I don't know whether he did or not. Came to my house when I first got back. Said he was. Yeah. Oh, I know another thing I think that many people would like to know. How, how did you come to make up some of your songs? Because I know that some of these songs are one that you wrote yourself. Isn't that right? Right. I mean, some people know how to sing, but not everybody knows how to make up a song. <laughs> well, uh, as I would think of a uh, bass, you know, I, I would write it down so I wouldn't forget it. And I would keep, that, keep on doing that till I thought I had enough bases to make a record then. Is that, this is recently then, because you didn't make records in between the last 25 years. This was like... Are you talking about back in 1928, or or uh, just or just now? Recently? Sure, I'm talking about back in 28. Oh, that's right. Well, did you sometimes play with fiddlers or something uh, like that back in Avalon? In 27, it was a fiddler came from Louisiana, Louisiana, uh, moved in there, my home, and he was a fiddler. Played with him. Uh, he would uh, help me play, you know, fiddle, you know, for uh, those country dances where I played for. We got together and practiced a little bit. Did you ever go to New Orleans? Never have. Never have. Ever over to Birmingham or Natchez? That's the first time I ever been to Birmingham was when uh, these music research came down in Mississippi and he got me and I. That's the way we traveled. Went through Birmingham, going, coming up. Yeah. I made about three trips up here before I moved up here. I moved up here and uh, they take me out in Baltimore, making tapes in different places, you know. And uh, so, uh, into the folk festival in Newport, Philadelphia. Did you go back home last month, or are you going to go back? Oh, um, I guess I I want to go uh, during the Christmas, but uh, last month I had got moved here. I've been living here in Washington now. Well, I moved here this last come September a year ago. I know where uh, about where Avalon is because I was down there last summer. I'd I think I drove right through Winona. I was in Meridian, and I drove up. Uh, I was in Hattiesburg. I drove up to Meridian. Hattiesburg. Yeah. That's my wife' home. Hattiesburg. If you met a, a some young fellow, 
suppose you met a 12 year old boy who was just admired your music and he wanted to learn how to pick a guitar what would you tell him uh, is there any kind of advice or hints you could suggest to him outside of just keep on trying <laughs> <laughs> I could uh, probably tell him something that he wouldn't hardly believe it but <laughs> He would hardly believe it, but it's true. <laughs> oh, now, what is it? <laughs> Listen, when you sleep, I said, sit your guitar right behind you. It doesn't like your pillows over there. So sit your guitar in that corner there. Sleep is right at your head. I said, you start going, you're learning just like that. He might not believe that, but that's right. <laughs> that's right. I know. What does, but I know it. <laughs> well, maybe it's because if you keep it near, you play it more often. Instead of maybe just once a day or something like that, you'd be playing when you go to bed and when you get up, as long as it's right near and handy. Yeah, it seems like to take a pick somewhere. John means love that guitar as much as you do your wife, and then you'll learn how to play it. <laughs> Good, right, right, right. <laughs> I just want to make sure that the wives are loved as much as the guitar. I'm suspicious of these these musicians. Well, you know, I got uh, Toshi Me, uh, uh, an 18 year old boy who who uh, loves your record so much. He listens to him and he picks a guitar awful good. I shouldn't say this in public because he. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to go any further than these words. Right. Just sing out and just cut that out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think it, it's it's uh, something that I feel like pointing out to young people who like music is that they don't feel they have to make a lot of money out of it. It's, oh, it's nice to make money. But an awful lot of good musicians have played most of their life just because they liked it, not because right. they were making money out of it. I mean, it's with you. I'm, I'm sure that if you'd had to depend on music most of your life, <laughs> you would, would have been starving. That's right. But, uh, because you like music, you just kept on playing it anyway. That's right, and I, I could help him out in saying this. If uh, you want to learn music and go and make music, you got to get it in here. That's in right. That's right. you got to get it in here. If you just say, well, I don't care anything about it, and maybe don't, so, but I'm going to play it. And yeah, you, you're you not going to be so successful, I take that. you got to get it in here. you got to want to make this music and like it. Well, it sure has been wonderful for us up here to get to know you, because you you heard it said how so much of the world doesn't know the other half of the world. Right. That's and right. to get to know you has been a great thing for many of us. A lot of Americans don't know but their own little corner of America. Like somebody up in Massachusetts might just know his little corner of a Massachusetts. Somebody out in California just knows his little bit of California. And I think through these songs, maybe a lot of Americans have gotten a little bit of taste of how each other's live. Right. That's right. To the community where you live, uh, Negro and white uh, people sat around and socialized together That's just right. the way we are doing now. That's right. That's right. That's right. Except they... when some nasty-minded person came <laughs> in, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> it wasn't, say, a town. Well, maybe... I'd say store here in uh, right in the little uh, town. I'll say town is well, uh, maybe down the the road about half a mile. That was no, maybe about a mile. That was no, no, like that. Before the days of automobiles, I guess you had these little separate towns. Well, it was one, it's the same name in the same town. It was just spread out among right. the communities, oh, the farming communities. In other words, one store 
Which That's serves right. one farming community and a mile away in That's Georgia. right. That's the right. Same way where we live now, Peter. I've got no education, I say. I read and write and figure a little bit, but I didn't get any further than the fourth grade. You know, that's, that went very far. Was right. I suppose then, after the fourth grade, why well, you had to help out your family earning money. Is that it? Right. That's right. Well, this is quite common around an awful lot of the country, farming. You had to have those extra hands and to harvest. You couldn't afford to hire to harvest. So did you have brothers and sisters? I did. My brothers, they're all older than I am. Sisters, too. I'm the baby boy. <laughs> <laughs> and so... By the time I grew up uh, big enough to do anything, why my older brothers they married off, why that left nobody there. My mother was with her. My daddy was dead. He died when uh oh he'd walk if he were living right now and walking that door, I wouldn't know who in the world it was. I'd never seen my daddy. And uh so that left just me and my sister at home, and we had to, you know, help our mother work. Was anybody um, still around? Your sister, brother or sister? Yeah. You no, know, the older one was married off, gone. Just me and one sister. So. I hope sometime in the next year or two that you will be able to go over to... England or one of those other countries, because they'd love to hear you over there. They think, really would. They you really think would. so? I know they would. <laughs> uh, it was actually a big disappointment to them when you weren't able to make the trip last year. And now the, they got these jet planes that are so smooth you, you wouldn't even hardly know you're flying. Toshi, you know, never wanted to fly, but when we went overseas, we figured it we'd have to go because it was so much quicker and ended up now now she gets a plane she hardly knows she's, she might as, well, might as well be getting into a bus <laughs> oh well it matters just getting used to something that's right well it looks like um, it's kind of hard for me to get used to it I've had 14 flights since I've been coming but you know not not overseas like that but, a friend of mine, Lee Hayes, is awful heavy. He says, when he went up and plane, he didn't feel like he should put his full weight down. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you feel the first time you went in a plane? Well, I, I felt, uh, I, you know, just thinking, you know. I think, oh. <laughs> well, I felt, all right. He said, uh, yes, it's... Uh, about the worst part of it is that when you get up off the ground, well, that didn't bother me, whatever. I got to thinking that I'm way up there. I look out of window and I could see the past old town, you know, and I could see some little toy cars look like running around down there just about that long. That's the way I feel. <laughs> what am I doing up here, you know? And the second flight, why? Uh, oh, I got to thinking. The man was needing a star. And uh, got above that star. Mm -hmm. He announced that he needed a star. He got above that star. Well, the worst part of it, he, he ran into a little bit of it before he, before he got high enough, you know. Directly announced, he says, "Well, we'll make some good speed now." He says, "We're thirty-five thousand feet in the air." I thought to myself, "Ooh, we!" <laughs> <laughs> and so I soon got all right. Though the stewardess came around, he said, "Meantime, sitting there." Guitars, you know, 
Yes, it's y'all are musicians. And, well, uh, would you mind playing a little music, boss, if we get a place for you to play it? So we told him no. We had a, a regular, what you call it? Hooting at it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about how I was then. We had lots of fun there. <laughs> Well, I sure do thank you for taking the time. Uh, what we'll do, we'll, we'll write this out on paper so you can see. Um, yes, if you want to add anything to it or subtract anything from it, you can do it. There'd be lots of people interested to hear it. It's, it, it's uh, not just what you have done, but what you haven't done, because some people think that if you... If you are going to play music, you must do this and must do that. And I think that you, myself, I think you you, uh, you said it when you said if, if you really want to play music and you have it here. That's right. Then That's right. you're going to find a way to do it. That's right. I can see uh, kids all around the country sleeping with a guitar at their head. <laughs> 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 I got to give a program tonight, so I better be getting.